Hey guys, it's Ryan. Let's pick up. We just talked about um, demineralization in the last video. Uh, we looked at the Stefan curve and how the area under the curve, uh, underneath this critical pH, refers to demineralization, which would be a leaking, a leaching of mineral from the tooth surface. But now let's talk about um, remineralization, the opposite effect, and restoring uh, minerals to the tooth surface. So saliva is really our knight in shining armor here. It secretes, uh, or it includes bicarbonate, uh, which is a weak base and serves as a buffer. So essentially it acts as a distractor and complexes with the extra hydrogen ions from, you know, from the fermentation or from acid that we're consuming or um, other sources. And the bicarbonate will complex with this hydrogen to form carbonic acid. There's a weak acid that would rather hold on to its protons instead of releasing them freely into solution. And so essentially, this means that the presence of bicarbonate has buffered or neutralized the pH so that the mouth is no longer so acidic and we don't have to worry as much about this hydrogen complexing with calcium and phosphate in the mouth and in the plaque which would draw out calcium and phosphate from the tooth. That's pretty cool how saliva is actually built to protect our teeth in this way. And this allows the tooth the opportunity to regain its strength by incorporating calcium and phosphate into its enamel. And that's just showing how we can remineralize the tooth surface. So let's go back and revisit the Stefan curve. And we talked about how it reaches a minimum within about 5 to 20 minutes of, of consuming sugar, but there's a more gradual recovery here that we didn't talk about. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes for bicarbonate to buffer pH back above the critical pH and restore normal pH of the mouth. So you can imagine that we could modulate this time and make it faster if we had more saliva. So sugar, uh, sh chewing like a sugar-free gum, a xylitol gum, would stimulate saliva production in the mouth and actually cause this curve to return above critical pH faster. On the other hand, a patient with dry mouth or xerostomia would take well over an hour to buffer pH back to normal because they have less saliva and thus less bicarbonate. So this graph is also a Stefan curve, but this time we uh, change the time to um, hours. So we have same plaque pH on the y-axis, this time hours on the x-axis. So we can look at the span of, say, an eight-hour workday. So we have a couple um, acid challenges or acid attacks here, uh, breakfast being the first one. And so our pH drops and then is gradually buffered back to normal. Say we have lunch here and then a mid-afternoon snack. So this eight-hour workday, we have three acid challenges, uh, five to 20 minutes to hit a minimum, 30 to six minutes uh, for the saliva to buffer a plaque back to a more neutral pH. This is pretty healthy. This is a pretty healthy Stefan curve. There's not um, that much uh, in the red here, so to speak. However, more frequent meals or snacks or uh, coffee with sugar in it cause more frequent acid challenges. And so if you had, say, a coffee right after you finished breakfast and maybe a soda after you finished lunch, uh, maybe an hour or two later, the bicarbonate is not given enough time to buffer the system back. And so you have prolonged acid damage, which could be a dangerous um, consequence. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, say, avoid coffee or avoid soda completely. It just means if you were to have it, group it with the meal rather than having it separately later. So it would look something more like this rather than this. So to review quickly, what all affects the Stefan curve? So how often you eat and drink is perhaps the most obvious one. The longer uh, between meals or the longer time between meals or the more frequent 
um, you're having um, acid challenges, the more um, the more at risk you are for acid erosion of teeth. And so the longer you wait between meals is better. Now how long you eat and drink for, if you the shorter you were to have a meal, rather than sp spreading it out over an hour or so, that would also be better. Of course, what you eat and drink also has um, a say in how acidic the pH will get. Also, the consistency of food. Sticky things like toffee can't be easily washed off with saliva. Um, also, what you eat or drink after sugar intake, so a glass of water or a slice of cheese, would help neutralize the acid and speed up recovery time to get back to the safe zone. So we can imagine this. Anything above critical pH is the safe zone. Anything below would be like the danger zone. And also, the amount and quality of the saliva will determine how quickly we can buffer back to the safe zone. So hopefully that makes uh, sense there. So we talked about bicarbonate, but saliva also contains calcium, which drives the reaction to the left again by Le Chatelier's principle. This time, um, we're adding something in to one side of the equilibrium. So the dynamic equilibrium seeks to restore the imbalance and then brings over some calcium to this side, uh, moving phosphate with it. So um, now we're talking about remineralization here, restoring mineral to the tooth and hardening it. So you can think of demineralization as destroying or dissolving mineral from tooth. You can think of remineralization as restoring mineral to the tooth. Now, there are also products like MI Paste, um, whose sole purpose is to buffer acids and increase concentration of free mineral in saliva and plaque, thereby increasing the concentration of these minerals in the teeth themselves, shifting the equilibrium to the left, again, remineralizing the tooth. Now, saliva also contains fluoride, say when a patient is drinking fluoridated water, using fluoridated mouth rinses and toothpaste. So why is fluoride so important to tooth health? It has two main functions. First of all, it remineralizes the tooth by driving the reaction to the left, just like calcium did, and it replaces the hydroxyl groups to make another appetite we already mentioned before, fluorapatite. And fluorapatite has a more stable crystalline lattice, which doesn't release calcium as easily. So, not only does it make the tooth harder, but it also makes the tooth more resistant to future acid damage. So, let's revisit the Stefan curve, and this time we're talking about floor appetite and not carbonated, um, carbonated hydroxyapatite. And so, this is the new and improved curve, and the critical pH you'll notice is lower at around 4.5, which means it will take a much stronger acid challenge to cause decay. So you can visualize the benefits just by looking at the area of the curve here and comparing it with the previous graphs. So we don't even reach under the critical pH with an acid challenge. So that's how awesome fluoride can be, is we don't even have to worry so much about um, the things we were talking about before when we have um, a steady fluoride exposure. I also want to mention one more thing before we uh, end the video. Fluoride levels in saliva tend to spike rapidly after using fluoridated toothpaste and then return to baseline after about uh, six hours or so, while fluoride levels in the plaque spike around 30 minutes to two hours after and also return to baseline around uh, six hours later. So their effects are mainly rem remineralizing a tooth and also building that strong outer layer of floor appetite to resist further decay. All right, so that's all I have for this video. Stay tuned uh, for our last part in the three-part series on science of cavities where we talk about the big three of cavity formation. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.